Good afternoon. My name is Peter Kopp. I'm the acting director of the Center for Genetic Medicine, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2010 Richard H. Scott Lecture. This lecture series is funded by a bequest from Richard A. Scott and by donations from his wife, um, Mrs. Anne Lisa Scott. And I thank Anne very much for joining us again uh, this afternoon. Welcome, Anne. <laughs> Dr. Scott graduated from Northwest Northwestern University Medical School in 1968. Dr. Scott's long career encompassed research, teaching, consulting, and clinical medicine. At the end of his career, Dr. Scott was chief pathologist, chief of staff, and director of laboratories at the Wetzel County Hospital in New Martinsville, West Virginia. He published very widely, and together with his wife, he shared a particular interest in education and research. The goal of this endowed lecture series is to bring internationally recognized scientists to Northwestern to give presentations about cutting-edge research. Past Scott lectures include, for example, Dr. Susan Lindquist, David Altshuler, Richard Lifton, David Botstein, Aravinda Chakravarti, Patrick Brown, Craig Mello, and Matthew Scott. I would like to especially thank Beth Herbert, Associate Director of Communications in the Center for Genetic Medicine, and Greg Beitel uh, for organizing this event. Moreover, I would like to thank uh, the staff of the Center for Genetic Medicine for all their efforts. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce briefly today's speakers, Dr. Ron Evans. Dr. Evans is a professor in the Gene Expression Laboratory and the Howard Hughes Medical Investigator at the Salk Institute in San Diego. He received his BA and PhD from UCLA then did his postdoctoral training with Jim Darnell at the Rockefeller University in New York. Studies that led to the identification of the first eukaryotic promoter for messenger RNA. In 1977, he joined the faculty of the Salk Institute, where he now holds the March of Dimes Chair in Molecular and Developmental Biology. Dr. Evans is particularly known for the cloning and characterization of nuclear receptors and establishing the nuclear receptor superfamily. This includes, among many other seminal contributions, the cloning of the first nuclear receptor, the glucocorticoid receptor, in 1985. The work of Dr. Evans' group continues to provide fundamental insights between transcription and physiological mechanisms. Dr. Evans is a member of the National Academy of Science, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has received prestigious awards, such as, among many others, the Lasker Award in 2004, and the Grand Médaille d'Or of the French Academy of Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Evans this afternoon. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and to uh, be able to tell you a little bit about some of the work that, that we're doing uh, on the engineering of body metabolism uh, and uh, the role of transcription uh, in, as a regulator of physiology uh, and disease. Um, in fact, from the time I began uh, my graduate studies, uh, really through today, I've been interested in transcriptional mechanisms and I started my, 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 my student life um, looking at retroviral genomes uh, before reverse transcriptase had been identified. But it was understood that retrovirus, ret retroviral RNA could integrate and become DNA, and we're interested in that, that mechanism. And that ultimately uh, led to work with Jim Darnell on DNA viruses, on DNA tumor viruses, uh, and how their gene program is, is elaborated, that then led to my interest in hormones and hormonal control of gene expression which is where I uh, have uh, spent the rest of my time trying to ponder. And I'm going to tell you, I, I realize there's two screens here. 
I'll only be, I'll be able to point at one. Uh, I'm going to tell you, as indicated up here, about a particular role for nuclear hormone receptors um, uh, and an enzyme called AP kinase uh, as regulators uh, of body physiology and metabolism. And I use this, uh, this slide as an illustration uh, for the first part of the talk, which sort of reveals a, a link between the nuclear receptor superfamily, which is uh, in this starry uh, graph up here, we call the nuclear receptor phylosphere, which, which is the expression, we have the very youngest members uh, uh, here as well. Um, the, uh, the expression of every single of the 48 human uh, nuclear receptors or 49 uh, uh, rodent nuclear receptors um, based on where they uh, like to be expressed in different tissues of the body. And so we interrogated, and this was done with David Mangelsdorf's lab, every tissue, every tissue meaning 49 tissues, um, uh, for their quantitative expression of, of every receptor uh, uh, and did that every four hours during the day. So we were looking at not only just plain expression at one time point, but dynamic expression throughout the day. And after producing about 500,000 data points of qPCR studies, we we're able to assemble one, one of the things is this graphic. And it shows which receptors like to be co-expressed uh, in general. And if you're closer together, that means you're more frequently linked to the expression of another receptor. And by uh, deduction, the closer you are, the more related your function is likely to be. Now that remains a proof that needs to be established. And you can see how many proofs you'd have to to actually dig into, but to the extent that we can dig into this, uh, it, it has proved to be very prescient uh, and, and predictive of relationships that weren't known uh, that have been subsequently been discovered and that we're currently exploring. And so this is an interesting aspect of the major, some of the major me regulatory metabolic switches uh, in the body uh, and uh, in their relationship to each other. Now, I said that a lot of this uh, work uh, is um, the, the, the nature of metabolism is inherently and intrinsically circadian. It occurs in the, the uh, daylight cycle, uh, and our, we have metabolic rhythms that are recurrent, and I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, this idea in, in a moment. But in trying to understand this concept uh, of the link between rhythm and metabolic rhythm, uh, and the life rhythm, so this is the clock part, and here's the, the regulators. We want to understand the integration mechanisms between a nuclear receptor dominated pathway and a clock dominated pathway. And I'll talk about the mechanisms that control the clock in a moment. Uh, and so as we get to an interface, uh, this is where we want to look. Um, what connects these two? Um, and what is the nature of the hinge that, that anneals rhythm uh, and circadian rhythm with biological rhythms su such as metabolism? And um, I'll, through this talk, I, there was a recent uh, exhibit at the Salk Institute uh, of the glass artist Chihuly, um, and uh, some of you know that, and so I'll, I'll show you, I'll, I'll we'll glance on a couple of, of uh, the things that were there. This is just one of the uh, Top, very top piece of approximately 20 foot tall sculpture that had uh, 1,400 pieces in it. You can see some of the individual pieces of different colors and shapes, uh, and which is spectacular. I'll show you a picture of it, the whole thing at the end, but um, uh, uh, just of the, some of the, the, uh, the beauty that was there, but also a, a, a second title, which is Unlocking Ability, Is There a Switch? And I'm gonna also talk about the role of transcription in, in, in both encoding ability, uh, and you can think of ability in many different ways, whether it's innate intelligence or innate ability to run or perform, um, and then uh, how we access that ability. So there's the genetic determination of certain types of traits, and then there's the, the actual uh, nature of, of manipulating that and achieving it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, little bit about how abilities are encoded, and then how transcription uncodes those abilities and how we can use transcriptional pathways to redirect uh, different types of ability. And I would argue that ability could be used for almost anything from various types of behavior uh, through just about any, any kind of thing that you want to consider 
that relates to uh, an ability that you can measure. Now historically, uh, William Harvey, which I show here, is sometimes considered the father of physiology, um, and he discovered something that was very profound, which is the circulation of the blood. Uh, before his work, it wasn't uh, realized that blood circulated. The liver was considered the most important organ uh, in the body, uh, and his contribution in his book De Modo De Cordis in 1628 was a landmark, a little bit like giving a telescope to astronomy. He really redirected physiology to around the nature uh, of how the body works in a physiologic context. And he's often uh, referred to as the father of physiology. And I'm very interested in not just uh, physiologic systems and endocrinology, but in the vasculature itself, which is more than just a passive amount of tubing. I think vasculature and vascular properties underlie a great deal of disease, and including metabolic and endocrine disease, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of that thinking. Um, paternity is sometimes disputable in any relationship, even with Mother Nature, um, and Claude Bernard, uh, who wrote uh, his book, uh, French uh, Physiologist, uh, in The Principles of Physiology, the concept of homeostasis, that physiologic systems, and he particularly studied salt uh, and sugar and fat balance. And he was interested in the role of the pancreas and liver uh, in controlling uh, sugar and fat metabolism. That um, uh, he, he said that no matter how much sugar or salt or fat that we put into our body during a meal, the body will defend itself and try to realign that system to, ge to generate a standard amount of sugar uh, or uh, lipid uh, circulating in the blood. And that mechanism to deal with, with varying amounts of environmental challenge, whether it's from food or other substances, led to his principles. And these, these were uh, another very prescient uh, approach to understanding the bigger picture. Now, an even bigger picture, um, and I'm not gonna call the next person the father of physiology, but the bigger picture is how does a physiologic system arise? What's the evolution of a process that can affect your toe or your knee or your gonads or your heart or your liver or your brain or all of them simultaneously? How do you evolve by one nucleotide at a time a super complex system that has a distributed effect? It seems like it almost is uh, past what this person uh, proposed uh, 150 years ago in The Origin of Species. Uh, and, but one thing that he didn't propose, in fact, that is rarely ever, ever proposed, is what is the origin of physiology? Now, everything has to have an origin, and because it's encoded in our genome, and because all of us operate in a similar way, hormonally, uh, and all of those receptors I showed you are part of the process, encoding is obviously the underlying feature. Uh, but how do you evolve a complex process? It's easy to understand how you change the KM of an enzyme, one step at a time, but how do you distribute a process? And we think this is why a lot of physiology is transcriptional, because it's not so much about the receptor or the pathway, but it's about regulation. And then you can evolve the regulatory sites, such as glucocorticoid receptor response elements or hormone response elements, which are hexamers. They're short nucleotide sequences. Those can come and go relatively quickly. So the origin of a rapidly evolving binding site, can in, you can use that to confer or interrogate and allow responsiveness of virtually any gene and every gene for every transcription factor. And I think that's one of the key features of transcriptional processes as being evolutionary underpinning of something like physiology. It allows every gene to access to every potential nuclear receptor. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned this about the clock and the integration system. The integration system in part involves the suprachiasmatic nucleus, I'll mention that in a moment, which uh, is the part of the brain that responds to the light signal uh, in the 24-hour uh, rotation process of the Earth on its axis. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of evidence suggests that the nature of feedback between the circadian network and the metabolic network is key, uh, and that uh, these are intertwined, and if you disrupt one or the other, that you then pit parts of, of the body system against each other. They naturally want to be coordinated. And if they become discoordinated, coordinated, 
you're going to run into metabolic disease. You're going to run into problems that get associated uh, with many of the types of, of, uh, of issues such as sleep disorders, metabolic disorders, diabetes, obesity. These are inherently disruptive to one part of the system or the other. And they're both trying to co coordinate each other. So physiology versus uh, rhythm. Uh, physiology is a self-regulating, adaptive, and recurrent process. Um, it resets itself every day. For every drop of uh, gonadal hormone that we make, and we're good at making gonadal hormones or adrenal hormones or thyroidal hormones daily, you have to get rid of 100% of that so the next day you can make another 100%. And so there's this process uh, that is resetting itself uh, in a diurnal fashion. And in fact, the xenobiotic metabolism of these hormones uh, is circadian itself. Then there's circadian rhythm, which is light set. It, but it is a rhythm that is self-regulating, adaptive, and recurrent. Uh, and it resets itself every day based on the daylight cycle. And when these are together, life is everything that is good. When they're not together, it's what begins to fall apart. And so we have to understand the nature of this interface and also the question of whether they're really fundamentally different. And I uh, really believe that, that the transcriptional basis of the clock, and the clock is a transcriptional machine, I'll show you that in a moment, is linked to the transcriptional basis of the metabolic uh, of, of metabolism itself. And I'll describe a little bit of that interface. Um, if I can move on here. Uh, this again is just the nuclear receptor superfamily, uh, zoomed in detail, steroidal hormones, uh, non-steroidal high affinity hormones here for vitamin A, vitamin D, and thyroid hormone, and then the orphan receptors, which are a very important part of this process. They include cholesterol uh, regulators, uh, bile acid regulators, fatty acid regulators, uh, and then control the xenobiotic system. And over here are regulators uh, of the circadian clock, nuclear receptors that control the clock, which are, which are shown in this part. And we also believe that several of these receptors uh, are important for clock function as well. I'm going to talk about, uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, the, a little bit about PPR receptors uh, briefly. And I will also talk in, that, in both parts of the talk uh, about some aspects of uh, the receptors that clustered together uh, on, that, uh, on that chart that I presented earlier on that phylosphere, these receptors all clustered next to each other as part of the circadian clock. And the point being is that this is a professional part of the circadian clock reverb. ROR is a professional part of the circadian clock. Um, and this receptor here, ERR, is a metabolic regulator of oxidative metabolism. And it's as close to the clock as anything else that we know of. And that suggests to me that the clock is really a metabolic clock. That it is that you are using the circadian clock to control metabolism and metabolism to control the clock. And we want to understand how that happens. So first I'll tell you how metabolism can control the clock. Um, <clears throat> and we're, I'm going to use AMPK as in a an example of this, uh, and AMPK, this uh, AMP kinase, which is shown here, is often considered a, a metabolic master switch. Um, I'm going to talk about it in, in his nutrient entrainment in the circadian control, and then I'll talk about uh, the role of AMPK in muscle performance uh, and oxidative metabolism. Uh, AMPK is activated by AMP. AMP is produced from exercise. It's also produced during low nutrients or starvation. Uh, it also can be manipulated by certain drugs, the most commonly prescribed uh, diabetic drug, glucophage, for example, or metformin, uh, is just one way to, to look at the potential regulation of this system. Um, <clears throat> now I want to move along and simply say a little bit more about uh, uh, the inter intertwining of these clocks. And uh, basically, this makes the point that I want to make, that there are three, uh, three critical things. One is this is the sun and the earth rotating, uh, so, th so we get uh, the 24-hour daylight cycle, uh, which is the, is the fundamental underpinning uh, of circadian rhythm. And uh, that it controls the, uh, the um, suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is considered the central clock, but I won't show it 
uh, but one of the, the things we showed in, in this study with this giant qPCR study is that the circadian clock appears to be embedded in every tissue, at least every tissue that we have explored. And it probably is, is in every tissue, a mechanism uh, of the clock, but only one tissue is directly wired to light. Now, the most circadian part of metabolism is whether you eat or you don't eat. Um, now, the circadian uh, field studies sleep, wake cycles. That's the way that you look at circadian rhythm, and that's how you monitor it uh, in animals. Um, in metabolic studies, you often look at fasting and feeding cycles. And the two groups really don't normally talk to each other. There's the metabolic groups and the circadian groups, because they use different languages. But when you're asleep, you are in a fast. When you are awake, you use your awake time naturally as a time where you get food. And you use, you use physical activity that is motivated behavior to move you to food. Um, and that involves a central effect, it involves appetite control, it involves uh, your stomach anticipating food, uh, you start to lick your chops, you start thinking of food, but you're also physically coordinating your move towards the refrigerator or if you're in the old days to kill something um, to eat or to harvest something because you need to eat. Um, and so physical component uh, to get here. And then there's the fasting when you're asleep and then there's the fed state when you're awake. And when things are working well, these coordinate clocks in the different tissues, liver, pancreas, heart, whatever, um, brain, um, to influence glucose, lipid, salt, uh, calcium, basal metabolic rate, uh, reproduction, fertility, inflammatory response, and xenobiotics. And when it goes off, you basically, and nuclear receptors play a critical role in modulating all these parameters, when it goes off, you have the opposite. You get diabetes, obesity, hypertension, osteoporosis, altered basal metabolic rates, uh, increase in cancer risk, increase in heart disease, and altered uh, drug metabolism and drug-drug interactions. In other words, you're screwed up. And this is, if you look at these diseases, you'll see many which are individually treated by either a diabetologist uh, or a cardiologist, and cardiologists treat disease completely different than diabetologists, and they don't, and they rarely look at this whole picture. Osteoporosis treated by an entirely different group. But the important point is that physiology is integrative and we need to keep that in mind as how it leads to disease. All right, I don't want to dwell too much on uh, uh, the link between metabolism uh, and rhythm. It, this is one point that, that shift workers, people who work at odd hours, who don't get up at the, the normal time and work when, they nor when you might normally be sleeping, have a 100% increased risk for obesity. So simply by altering your sleep cycle, uh, for the purpose of work and earning a living, you have doubled your, uh, your risk, 100% increase uh, for obesity, and that increases your risk for diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, uh, and cancer. It's known that this uh, obesity reduces exercise. Uh, there's many features that relate to metabolic disease that underpin uh, 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 progressive problems. So we want to understand now, first uh, case is how the clocks that are not exposed to light know what time it is uh, and how uh, this feeding and fasting cycle can integrate into that process and that's what really I'm talking about here is we know how this one roughly gets synchronized and that leads to an activity to either sleep or awake um, and, and that we metabolically look at this as fasting and feeding but how does that relate to the peripheral clocks? Uh, that control glucose homeostasis and energy balance. And first, let's just look at the clock, what's known from uh, the wonderful circadian genetics. And the clock is a transcriptional machine. It's a beautiful oscillatory mechanism that's con comprised of activators and repressors. The main driving activator is BMOL, transcription factor uh, that creates the activation loop. Uh, it forms a heterodimer with clock uh, protein, and then these bind to E boxes, and they activate transcription. Partly what they activate are transcription of repressors such as Reaver, uh, which binds to one of the very few response elements that control this, this gene. 
This gene does not like to be regulated by, by very many things, very many transcription factors. It's a privileged regulatory target. Um, and so repressor here, and then it encodes additional repressors that come back, and these co-repressors, uh, the purine cryptochrome genes, now shut off clock. They bind this, uh, the, they, they bind to BMOL clock, and now turn it off. Um, so first you have the, uh, the repressor loop uh, and the activator loop. And I should say ROR is a nuclear receptor. It's a constitutive activator, binds to the ROR response element, or RRE. These two transcription factors bind to the exact same sequence. One is an accelerator, ROR. The other is a break, reverb. And so you're opposing an activator against the repressor. Now, reverb is the most cycling part of this. And so it's almost like the, the accelerator is permanently on and using the brake to control it. And as that brake is activated and as reverb comes on, BMOL turns off. When BMOL turns off, the repressor goes away. And then once the repressor goes away, the system turns itself back on. So you have repression loops and activation loops, and it's controlled at the transcriptional level. Now, how does this work in, in non-light exposed tissues? And briefly to, to uh, talk about this resetting mechanism, I, I'll tell you a very quick story. I wish it was uh, uplifting, but in fact, it's degrading. And actually, it's about protein degradation. Um, as a regulatory mechanism, this is this uh, repression loop, the activation loop, the, the control of repressors transcriptionally by the activators. And as these come up, then they'll repress the, the clock mechanism uh, in that fashion. Uh, and we want to know what, is the, is, is what controls the, so, the dark force here. And we know it has to involve protein degradation because uh, um, Joe Takahashi and others use genetic screens to look for genes that impact on the clock. And some were FBOX proteins, which were involved in protein degradation. And so, and FBOX proteins like to interact uh, with uh, uh, phosphorylated proteins. And as shown here, here's an FBOX protein. It associates with cryptochrome, degrades cryptochrome. When cryptochrome is degraded, the clock can turn on. So cryptochrome shuts it off. Cryptochrome degradation turns it on. What controls the phosphorylation of cryptochrome? And I'll simply uh, tell you that it's going to be AMP kinase. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about AMP kinase very quickly uh, so you can see it here. AMP kinase, this tripartite uh, enzyme, is normally inactive uh, with increased AMP kinase ratio to AMP. And it doesn't take much to change this ratio. Um, then AMP. Uh, uh, kinase can become activated, but there's an upstream activator called LKB. Uh, and this was in that previous chart, and I'll show it to you again. Uh, this is also known as AMP kinase kinase. And the interesting thing about LKB, it was isolated as an oncogene. When you mutate LKB, you have a great increase in risk for breast cancer, uh, um, uh, intestinal cancer, stomach cancer, um, and uh, a, a deregulation of the uh, regulatory system that controls cell growth. Uh, and so this is a, this is a, a, it's a, it's, it's a regulator of AMP kinase that controls energy demand and replenishes ATP. But when this is gone and you can't control this properly, then AMPK has difficulty being activated. And when you do not activate AMPK, you're in trouble. Uh, for, for many reasons, uh, you're, you're predisposed towards uh, many different kinds of cancers and other uh, kinds of diseases. Now, to understand what the phosphorylation site might be, Kachalami in my lab took all possible uh, phosphorylation sites in AMP, in, in, um, AMP kinase uh, and, in, sorry, in cryptochrome. Uh, looked for all phosphorylation sites in cryptochrome, made synthetic peptides for all possible sites, and challenged them with a matrix of kinases, and came up with AMP kinase as the, as the kinase that was able to directly phosphorylate uh, SEER71 uh, in, uh, in cryptochrome, shown here. Uh, and, uh, and in addition, uh, uh, um, uh, SEER280, a second site, she identified, and I'll show you that in a moment. 
The point is that cryptochrome is a direct AMPK target at SEER 71 and SEER 280. Um, <clears throat> if you put an aspartic acid replacement uh, into cryptochrome that mimics a phosphate, which is shown here, you get spontaneous degradation. This form of cryptochrome just degrades. It's a take it to the bank kind of observation. Um, and, uh, and I won't go through the data that shows that, that it, the phosphorylated cryptochrome directly interacts with the F-box, but it does. Also, the 280 site uh, is important, but obviously not as profound in terms of regulation, but they act together, and so it's even more profound uh, in that context. And so we have activating mutations, we have uh, alanine inactivating mutations that artificially stabilize uh, cryptochrome, and we can study this process using a set of cells that Katja uh, produced, which are AMPK wild type or null cells. And the point being um, is that we can use these cells to determine the importance of AMPK in the phosphorylation of cryptochrome normally uh, and what happens when you lose it. And uh, we can activate AMPK artificially using a drug, and I'll tell you more about this drug. The drug is called ICAR. Um, and basically, when you add ICAR, it's an AMP mimetic, uh, cryptochrome rapidly is degraded. So you activate AMPK, cryptochrome gets phosphorylated, it's degraded, but that does not happen in AMPK null cells. ICAR does not have that effect, um, indicating that, that uh, AMPK is a direct regulator of cryptochrome. It doesn't say it's, it's the only one, it just says it, it can do it. Um, we can use this exact process to alter rhythms in, in cultured cells. So Cultured cells will have a nice circadian rhythm. And <clears throat> keep in mind that when glucose is low, you're going to activate AMP kinase. That's your sleeping phase, your fasting phase. When glucose is high, that's your activity phase. You've eaten. Uh, and so AMPK will be off. Uh, and so you, have, you can mimic this in cell culture by either starving cells, uh, and you're activating AMPK. And when you do that, uh, you see that you get rid of the repressor, and when you get rid of the repressor, you activate the transcription of repressors. Um, when, you, uh, when you starve cells, it becomes activated, the gene becomes activated, um, because AMPK is activated. When you overfeed cells with a lot of glucose, you, you, um, which, which is shown here in black, you suppress rhythm because you don't need AMPK will not be activated, so high glucose suppresses, low glucose activates. High glucose with ICAR artificially activate AMPK. You again, in, you induce chemical starvation, essentially. Um, and it's a beautiful experiment that, that, that Katja did, really just showing that the entire system works. And with Craig Thompson uh, and uh, Sachin Panda, uh, we're also able to show through the starvation chemical starvation uh, and uh, in vitro system, that you can shift the period of the circadian rhythm in culture uh, by uh, treating with ICAR or altering sugar balance uh, in these cells. Now, what does this mean in vivo? I'm just going to tell you, it, it works almost exactly the same in vivo. It's a little bit different kind of uh, question, but basically, if you give a single injection of ICAR uh, to an animal, uh, suddenly there's a, a big depletion in the liver of cryptochrome, and you can see that degradation here. Uh, it, it really disappears quickly. So ICAR has a very similar effect uh, in vivo. Um, and the last part I'm going to mention here uh, is um, the ability of AMPK to set that, that circadian rhythm in a tissue that is not exposed uh, to the light, and that's going to be liver, which is one of your major metabolic tissues. And the point uh, that it, it, it is shown here is that mice, when they're placed in a um, cycle, and then we're going to put them in a, com in a complete darkness, and when we do that, we're going to give them a single injection of ICAR at the beginning of that, uh, that artificial time, and that artificial time is shown in the normal time is the dark dark, and the, and the gray is, is the new dark. Uh, so they're kept in complete darkness at that point. And, the, and there, what this shows is that a single injection of ICAR at that point, um, <clears throat> eight hours uh, into uh, this, the uh, uh, dark cycle, um, is, 
uh, has a, a period has the potential to delay, give you a phase delay as is indicated here. So this means that you can actually reset rhythm, uh, circadian rhythm, with AMPK in liver. And this provides a way for nutrients now and nutrient sensing to go nuclear. And one of the important features of this is that AMPK typically is thought as an enzyme that lurks in the cytoplasm to control mitochondrial activity, and it does. But the idea that it goes in the nucleus and acts to control the stability of nuclear cofactors to destabilize repressors and therefore activate the circadian clock provides a novel mechanism to uh, look at energy entrainment and nutrient entrainment uh, at, at the important point where it needs to, to interface, which is the transcriptional uh, control of the clock itself. So we now know how to manipulate that, and we've, set, we've solved a major problem in trying to understand the interface between metabolism uh, and the clock. Now, I want to keep uh, going on this, this point of AMPK and metabolic, its central role in metabolic regulation. And I'm going to go back to a little bit of this part, the feeding uh, and activity cycle. And I'm going to really focus on how we get food. Um, and we get food by moving muscles. And I want to, and an important part of this uh, is you're going to get here, which is can transcription substitute for exercise? Um, and this gets back to the ability concept as well. That if, if, if abilities are encoded transcriptionally, and we understand enough of that encoding mechanism, can we use that to actually re-engineer uh, metabolism or properties of, of uh, parts of the body in a predictable way? Because if you can, you will learn a lot from doing that. And so we wanted to ask this question of whether, whether we can use transcriptional switches uh, to uh, alter exercise. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit uh, of a context, because one, one of the holy grails in medicine is a pill that could offer the benefits of fitness, especially for those who can't work out. It's, you can, many of you can see the potential benefits of that. And I'll tell you that previously we created a transgenic mouse we call the marathon mouse, which involves uh, overexpression of a nuclear receptor called PPR delta. I'm not going to tell you too much about it, other than we proved that that receptor was sufficient to engineer a mouse that was called the marathon mouse. And that was about eight years ago. Um, and, uh, and it'll come up a little bit later. But what I wanted to uh, deal with in this case is a slightly different idea that relates to our humanness uh, and muscle. And humans are the only primate that have evolved endurance. Humans are natural endurance athletes. We can run, anyone in this room can run, uh, with some training a pretty long distance. But even if you can't run uh, a long distance, many people can. It's a long documentation in human history that humans are good runners. No other primate is a good runner. And that's in part because we stood upright. It's in part because we evolved new behaviors. Becoming endurance runners allowed us to become predators. So the evolution of a, of a physical trait gave rise to a behavioral trait. Uh, and that's predatory behavior. So we became predatory primates. And that has played a big role uh, in terms of, of our own uh, 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 evolution as a, as a human species. And also illustrates the immense integration of peripheral physical functions, such as endurance, and behavioral central functions. Uh, because they have to be integrated if you're going to be successful, particularly as a predator, which involves a lot of of timing, uh, a lot of, of hormone, adrenaline, steroid, glucocorticoid, stress response, fight and flight response, visual uh, attention to the, to the prey, awareness of your environment, all happening simultaneously. Uh, it's a little bit about what, uh, since I'm from the West Coast, so what we're, we're thinking about with between the Lakers uh, and the Boston Celts. Um, there's a lot of different things that go on when you're either in sports, which is our modern predators, uh, or in any other, any, anything that we do. Are there any uh, long distance runners in the audience? Are there any marathoners here? See, hands going up. Yeah. Could you all leave right now? <laughs> we don't like you. Um, so uh, the ultimate marathon, I'll make you guys feel a little bit worse, like we all feel about you. 
um, that the black pole warbler, which is uh, uh, a bird that lives up uh, in Canada and on the, the east coast of the United States, uh, at this time of year, this month, they all migrate to the east coast and they start gathering uh, in, the, in Massachusetts. And sometime around the beginning of, the lot, beginning of July, they congregate in Cape Cod. Now, in this month, they become hyperphagic. Their behavior changes. They do very little activity and they double their weight all in fat. Um, and this little bird goes from nine grams to about 18 grams, but it's all fat, no exercise. Um, and then uh, sometime in the, between the first and second week of July, they will fly off together simultaneously to Venezuela. Um, 2,200 mile flight, nonstop obviously, um, and without any training, and pretty much blubber balls when they leave. Uh, and so they're all, they're all obese, technically, by any definition, yet what is it that allows muscle, the intrinsic property, to be perfectly fit for a 2,200 mile run when you can never practice for that? This is an innate ability. I want to talk a little bit about innate ability, and that relates to type 1 muscle fiber. So type 1 muscle fiber is your endurance fiber. It's what is in your diaphragm. It's what's in your soleus. It's what's in muscles that, that do not stop beating, like your heart. Well, they all stop at some point, but hopefully not for a long time. These are your most oxidative muscle. And uh, when we were looking at engineering muscle, we made the interesting observation that one nuclear receptor called ERR gamma, uh, estrogen-related receptor gamma, uh, is expressed particularly at, at high levels uh, in type 1 or endurance or non-fatiguing muscle. And this is an illustration of that. You can't see it so well with the lights on. But we have knocked in a LAC-Z reporter into the ERR gamma gene. And this is the soleus muscle. So endurance muscle groups as, as a fiber bundle in the context uh, of the gastrocnemius, which is mostly uh, non-blue, which is the white type of muscle, the gly glycolytic muscle, oxidative glycolytic. The quad is mostly a glycolytic white meat type muscle. You can see a little bit of blue in it. Um, so migratory birds, ducks, will be a lot of dark meat because that's endurance fiber because they fly long distances. Chickens and turkeys can't fly at all uh, because uh, they have no, that muscle's been bred out of them. Uh, and humans have a lot of endurance muscle um, and because of our predatory nature. The spotted hyena uh, is, a, is a canine species uh, that uses endurance as a predatory trait in Africa. I saw these animals. Uh, and they're fearless, they're reasonably aggressive, they hunt in packs, they're very loving to each other, uh, but they cannot outrun a prey, but they can wear the prey down. And human predatory traits are the same. We, we run prey down, and then we kill at the end. So ours is hours of tracking, as opposed to a lion or a leopard, which has about 60 to 90 seconds. So we want to understand the importance of ER gamma, and we got a surprise from this. Firstly, the non-surprise is when we engineered it into muscle, and now we're, trying, we're overexpressing ER gamma in the type 2 or glycolytic muscle uh, off of a human alpha scale actin promoter. And these now uh, white meat type muscles are turning uh, much pinker. The soleus doesn't change. It's maximally oxidative. And so you can see it looks the same. But these muscles, the quad, for example, shown here in gastrocnemius, really uh, redden up quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> and that indicated there was a, a major oxidative shift. Um, <clears throat> if we look at actually ER gamma protein here, I mean, it, natural expression, it's lowest in the, in the whitest of the, our muscles and it's highest uh, in uh, in the most oxidative, and we began to speculate that this is a determinant of the underlying intrinsic features of the type 1 muscle. And one of the intrinsic features of this muscle, to be oxidative, you have to be able to deliver energy to muscle in real time. That is, endurance athletes can't, not, cannot store their energy in the muscle. It has to be delivered by the blood circulation from peripheral sources like adipose tissue or the liver that provides sugar or fat. 
And so runners have to get into a rhythm that allows blood supply. And the limitation is vasculature. You have to deliver the energy in real time and remove the metabolites in real time. When you're in that rhythm, you're, you're producing and delivering at exactly the right rate. If you want to increase your endurance, you need more vasculature. And it, conversely, if you stop running for a while, your vasculature, which takes energy to maintain, will uh, reduce itself. Your muscles will become weaker because oxidative muscle needs mitochondria. All muscle that is immobilized, uh, the mitochondria will drift away. And any of you know who's had a cast on for a week, how rapidly your muscle atrophies. And that's because of loss of muscle mass and loss of mitochondria. And so we're interested in, in what happens now that we've made the muscle redder. How does this muscle look? First really interesting thing for us is that it has very high uh, staining for succinate dehydrogenase, classic stain for oxidative mitochondria. Very dramatic, uh, and this is a hallmark of type 1 muscle fiber, even though most of this is naturally uh, a low SDH staining um, tissue. The, the, uh, in addition, and what was really important here uh, is the nature of, of, uh, of inducing not just mitochondrial effects, but effects that relate to muscle fiber itself. And what I'm going to show you here is that these mice, uh, ER gamma mice, uh, exhibit this uh, very dramatic increase in myosin heavy chain one. This is the typical marker of oxidative or slow twitch muscle, the level there and the level after ER gamma expression. This is a huge increase and the most dramatic increase I know of in, in any animal uh, of this particular slow twitch marker. Other markers uh, of slow twitch, including this heavy chain, which is called oxidative fast muscle, um, uh, is increased. Uh, and all the way through glycolytic muscle, where glycolytic myosin heavy chains are reduced. So you're reducing your glycolytic fibers and you're dramatically increasing your oxidative fibers, your stretch fibers, to give you more of the type of stretch that's involved in long distance running. And then you also activate parallel uh, metabolic programs, uncoupling programs, uh, uh, pyruvate D. Uh, the hydrogenase kinase, which is going to, in, uh, in the kinase will inhibit private dehydrogenase, and so you're going to inhibit glycolysis with this, and, and again, promote oxidative metabolism, and also cytochrome uh, 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 induction. Now, the consequence of this is that these animals uh, are uh, actually profound runners, uh, and that's really what I'm, what I'm showing you uh, here, is that if you put them on a treadmill, this is a treadmill, uh, typical treadmill test for our mice, and it's a classic uh, test that we've used. It's just like a human treadmill. The only difference is that they can't get out. Um, and, and that has a certain advantage, and I, I'm sure that I could get anyone in this room to lose weight if I could put you in a treadmill, which you can't get out of. And it has a small electrical shock station in the back. Um, um, but we can monitor all parameters the, in, in these metabolic treadmills. Uh, and this is the control mouse, and this is the ERR gamma transgenic. Uh, and you're, what you're going to see uh, is this, this mouse can run more, more than an hour longer than the control mouse simply by being engineered, actually almost an hour and a half in this case. Um, and so uh, it's a dramatic uh, effect. Now. Why is this, why, why can this happen? And uh, this is an important uh, question. And, and how do you get innate endurance? And one of the things that you need is increased vasculature. Now, there's only two ways that we know to really how to get to induce vasculature. Uh, and that's by the principal one, which would be activation of the HIF-1A pathway, which is highly inducible by hypoxia uh, or other means to induce VEGF production and innate or neovascularization. The other way is by exercise through the induction of PGC1 alpha, a nuclear receptor cofactor that Bruce Spiegelman showed was sufficient to induce VEGF expression on its own in absence of HIF1 induction, but just simply by activating oxidative pathways uh, uh, through an exercise dependent process. 
And so uh, that, that was very interesting because those two pathways then in muscle become very important for developing inducible vasculature. But what we found with, in the ER gamma mice is that VEGF and, and, and um, highly oxidative uh, 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 gene pathways were induced. This is VEGF induction and FGF induction. All these are vascularogenic molecules. Um, and importantly, this transgenic mouse, in absence of exercise, in an absence of hypoxia, and an absence of PGC1 induction and an absence of HIF induction, two transcription factors, now results in a, in a dramatic increase in innate vasculature. And we think this begins to solve the problem of how innate muscle, such as type 1 muscle, or type 1 muscle, achieves its innate ability to perform without having undergone tremendous uh, exercise demand or hypoxic demand. Um, and it means that there's a third way to control vasculature, which is through this ERR gamma uh, uh, genetic demand. So now we're putting a genetic demand on tissue, and it's responding in a yet a different way that anticipates the need it's going to be placed under. Um, to prove this, we engineered C2, C12 as a muscle cell line to have ERR gamma expression or not. Uh, and we took the media from these engineered uh, cells, which are shown here, or wild-type control, and we ask, could that media contain factors that would promote uh, tube formation in vascular endothelial cells, um, smooth muscle vascular endothelial cells, I mean, um, uh, shown here. And the answer is, is it's going to be very hard to see in, with this light, but uh, the media um, uh, induces very robust uh, induction of these uh, vascular tubes. And so ER gamma, even in cultured cells, induces a VEGF program uh, in absence of PGC1 induction and in absence of HIF uh, induction. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to keep moving, but I just want to summarize this part and then I'll give, give you a very brief closer. Um, ER gamma, we think, is very important. Uh, that it's a, a marker or a, a, a unique marker, transcription marker, of type 1 muscle uh, and, and a, obviously a regulator of type 1 muscle function. Its overexpression drives the uh, oxidative slow twitch transformation of fast muscle to slow muscle, boosts running endurance, controls vascular gene network independent of HIF1 and, and exercise and PGC1 alpha. Uh, and that by doing this, it can promote e the needed vascularity to allow the demand that's going to be placed on that muscle to integrate with the blood supply. So supply and demand. Uh, and so you have to have some way to get supply and demand in advance. Uh, and this, we think, is a, a way in which that is achieved. Now, the last thing I want to mention uh, is, is the last part of the AMPK story. Um, and I mentioned uh, to you that we previously uh, had engineered mice with PPAR delta, which we, were our original marathon mice, as opposed to our newer ones, which are super marathon mice. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, uh, getting back to AMPK and as an integrative mechanism, and I, and I uh, glanced over a, a important part of the engineering of um, the, the ER gamma metabolism, which I didn't have, I don't have yet as a slide, but the question, one question is why does ER gamma and how can ER gamma lead to this profound vascular response in absence of HIF and in absence of PGC1 alpha? And one thing that we find is that in this engineered muscle, AMP kinase is now genetically active, that is, it seems to be permanently active in type 1 muscle fiber normally, and that wasn't known, but also now in the over-engineered uh, muscle. And <clears throat> so uh, getting back to the last part of the AMPK story, um, we had noticed that when we were trying to use drugs to engineer metabolism, because it, as much as you can do it genetically, and I can engineer uh, lots of animals uh, genetically to be better runners, 
practically speaking, for anyone that's in this room or someone who has a medical problem, you can't engineer them genetically. And so you want to look at being looking at druggable pathways. And nuclear receptors, many of them are druggable. Here our gamma turns out to be probably druggable. There are drugs that are being developed for it. PPR delta is druggable, and we tried using uh, 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 PPR delta drugs to answer this question. Can drugs or exercise mimetics substitute for exercise? And that's what I'm going to show you in this very last part. A PPR delta drug that we call GW because it was made initially by GlaxoSmithKline, if you give it to uh, mice for five weeks, gets in their body, does a lot of engineering of metabolism. Um, we don't actually give them Diet Coke. That's just a joke. Um, people seem to get really serious about that for some reason. We do give them uh, this cocktail glass with an umbrella, though. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, so half the group get the drug and half the group don't. And then we run them on the treadmill after five weeks. And the remarkable thing is that not one thing happens. Their performance does not change at all. Not even five minutes different between the group that gets the drug or doesn't get the drug. And so the answer to that is, um, Simon Cowell just did not like this experiment. And uh, we were worried that this is what was going to happen to our grant. Um, and so we were getting very desperate about that. But he seems to uh, 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 think that if you, if you throw enough money at it, maybe you can get it to work. And so we rethought the problem. And the way that you, all of us in this room, can change our performance as adults um, a little bit different than if you're an infant, um, it, the way that you change is to actually perform. The, you perform, if you lift weights, you're going to get stronger. If you, I put you on a treadmill, especially if it's enclosed and you can't get off, <laughs> for 30 minutes a day, at the end of one month, your performance will be enhanced. It is your ability to run a long distance will be tremendously increased. So performing unlocks a potential. Now, I was looking at how transcription unlocks the potential, but performance, we know, unlocks that potential. Um, and so we, what we did is we, put, we made mice perform. And we put them on a treadmill. And then we gave them the drug or not. So, and you can see that they like performing right here. Um, <laughs> this is an accurate characterization of their mood because we asked them about that. And then uh, we ask what, what happens in the presence or absence of the drug. They all will improve with the performance, but with the drug, it's much more dramatic. And in fact, these mice then, then gain from going from 1.8 kilometers to 2.8 kilometers in ter terms of running time uh, and distance, which is shown basically here. So uh, if you don't get the drug, this is, you, imp you do improve. But if you do get the drug with training, you dramatically improve your distance from uh, about whatever that is, 1.6 or something, to about 2.6 or 2.7, whatever that number is up there. The point being, the drug now has a dramatic effect, which is, again, more than an hour benefit in terms uh, of increased time, when previously it had no benefit. And so we're interested, what, what was the purpose of, and how, how did exercise unlock the potential? And I'm going to tell you it's a transcriptional answer. Uh, and I'm going to tell you it's AMPK again. Um, this is the AMPK pathway that I showed you previously. LKB, uh, in combination with AMP, is able to activate AMP kinase. This leads to many different kinds of effects uh, in the animal. But it also leads to an activation of a transcriptional program for metabolism in the muscle. Activates several hundreds of genes uh, that we have studied. And that led to a general question. If you can use this pathway uh, to, if AMPK is required to allow PPR delta to work, would giving just an AMPK drug alone, this drug would be ICAR, um, would this drug be sufficient to promote the benefits of exercise without any exercise? An AMPK drug. So we, I call this very last thing zero minute abs. It's preparing for the commercial. Um, and of course, um, there are a lot of commercials that, on television, infomercials, that 
promise you all sorts of benefits with the minimum type of exercise or weight loss without doing anything, eat what you want, as long as you buy what they want you to buy. Um, and of course, it would, if, if it really worked, it, it would be a miracle, but of course, people believe what they see, but, you know, I mean, Sarah Palin's on the air, and a lot of people seem to believe it. But mostly, what is on television is just an infomercial. Um, and it's just about the person who's giving that infomercial. They don't really work. So, um, now I'm not, now I'm gonna tell you something. Zero minute abs, everybody. Um, so here's the drug, ICAR. This is a, uh, a investigational drug. It was developed more than 15 years ago. It's off patent, but it's still in clinical trials. Um, it has been tried for diabetes and cancer. It was dropped in both cases because it, in part it was too early on the scene. Uh, wasn't known how to use it correctly, and second is it's an injectable. And at that era, drug companies did not like injectables. But ICAR is very effective at activating AMPK. And I'm gonna tell you that, that um, ICAR does a few interesting things to muscle. One, it activates a set of genes, which are shown here, uh, that are all metabolic. So a genomic effect of AMPK again, that we're triggering with a drug, ICAR, and the black bars. And an important feature of this is that if you do this in PPA or Delta knockout animals, you can entirely lose this effect. So the, uh, the induction uh, is completely lost uh, in PPA or Delta deficient mice. And it doesn't mean that, that all actions of AMPK are lost or depend on PPA or Delta, but it means that the genes that at least we're looking at, or at least that I'm showing you, uh, are dependent on PPA or Delta. Uh, and that's uh, interesting when thinking of the genomic pathway through which uh, ICAR and AMPK can act. If you just give 30 days of ICAR, it's the equivalent in terms of succinate dehydrogenase of 30 days of exercise. So 30 days of drug, 30 days of exercise. Now this doesn't mean that these drugs, the, that this drug will promote increased ability to run, but in fact it does. It's not as profound as some of the other effects that you've seen, but on the other hand, we don't have to genetically engineer the mice. And that's something that you know, we're not gonna do with people. We're not gonna genetically engineer everybody, uh, but anybody in principle could take ICAR on the assumption that it was safe. And in people who had poor endurance or people who were unable to exercise or frail or immobilized to hospital stay or wheelchair uh, many different kinds of ways you, you can think an exercise mimetic could be beneficial, then, uh, then uh, a compound like ICAR uh, could have a big uh, potential impact. And that includes its known uh, uh, ability to be an insulin sensitizer. And that fits in with the integration uh, of, of AMPK being an integrator of the central clock, of the peripheral clock, and of many important metabolic parameters uh, in the body, including overall uh, metabolic integration uh, by nuclear receptor signaling. And <clears throat> just to summarize this last part, targets, and this could be ER gamma uh, or PP or delta, AMPK, nuclear uh, being activated by ICAR, a druggable pathway being activated by this, K, this GW compound directly there, the combination, ER gamma, uh, moving this as well, uh, and therefore giving rise to a potential new class of compound we call exercise mimetics. It's not all happily received by the exercise uh, sp sports medicine or, 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 uh, uh, or exercise community or people who study muscle physiology. The reason uh, is logical because when you study muscle physiology, uh, much of it is about the beauty of the mechanics and our understanding uh, of motors, actin, myosin, and what is it that takes it something to be a muscle, and how do you get to be a muscle? But much of the, of the literature in muscle physiology subtracts out one part of the muscle cell uh, that is almost, almost invisible when you have that little dial thing on, you know, do you want this color to be transparent or something on PowerPoint? And the most transparent part uh, of the muscle to muscle physiologists is the nucleus. And what has not been realized is that the nucleus is immediately responsive as soon as you begin exercise. 
And it's not been possible to subtract out the nucleus uh, from muscle improvement of muscle performance as opposed to the thought that you need to damage muscle and repair it to improve it. And so we can selectively uh, subtract the nucleus out or add the nucleus to an enhanced level. And in our view, the nucleus is at least as important, if not uh, more important, because we can promote the benefits of exercise without actually doing any exercise. Uh, and so that means the nucleus is sufficient. And that's why I think we can engineer pathways such as endurance. I think that's why endurance could evolve in the first place. It's, it's an initial benefit once you get it. It's a selective benefit. Well, I'm going to end by uh, another picture uh, of the Chihuly stack. This is this thing. It's about 25 feet tall and has 1,200 pieces overlooking now at the Salk. Uh, and th these are called floats. They were these, these were black hollow balls that were floated on this, con on this travertine uh, plaza just uh, in part for the look of it. Um, it was a very interesting exhibit. I want to thank the people who did the work. Uh, Bihang Narkar, uh, who started it, uh, the, the running, and he was the one uh, who did the AMP case study with endurance, did that work with Ruth Yu uh, and Michael Downs and Grant Barish. Uh, Ruben Shaw is an expert on um, uh, the uh, circadian clock, and I left off the person who did the circadian clock work, I can't believe it, Katja Lamia, uh, uh, who is uh, the uh, outstanding postdoc uh, who did uh, the work uh, in my lab on the first part, which is the impact of, of AMPK on uh, cryptochrome, published in Science Paper uh, and uh, outstanding. And she did some of that work with Uma Sashdeva, who is a student in Craig Thompson's lab at UPenn. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and thank you all. Thank you very much, Ron, for an outstanding lecture. Um, if you have questions, please ask for the microphone. Maybe I'll start off. What happens if you combine ICAR treatment with exercise? You know, is this attractive to the people who are cycling in the Tour de France? You know what? I think that I left out my slide, but there was a, an article uh, in the um, uh, in, uh, I'm trying to remember the news, there was an article in a British newspaper, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me, following the Tour de France, the, the two drugs, something called hematide, uh, which is a variant of erythropoietin, and ICAR. Following our paper, uh, these were two new drugs that were reported to be used, and they knew that looking at, at uh, trash cans where needles were discarded anonymously <laughs> uh, during the race, and they checked them out, and uh, one was a, a novel EPO derivative, and the other was ICAR. And I, I, we had anticipated that ICAR would be used initially by the group that probably needs it the least, which are athletes, um, but they view themselves as actually needing it to compete. Um, we would given samples of ICAR, a HPLC test for blood and urine for ICAR and the GW compound to the World Anti-Doping Association and both of them became uh, banned substances, but only about three months after uh, the tour. Um, but there's no doubt the athletes saw this very quickly. Now, what we don't know is whether ICAR can benefit someone who already is at the high end of athletic, athletic performance. We're interested in something called super endurance. That is, if an athlete can achieve a maximum level of endurance, is that a maximum? Or you know, is there something that stops it? Or can you go beyond that with uh, drug and drug enhancements? And we don't know that in a healthy way. And we don't know that yet. Or do you explode? Um, <laughs> um, it seems to me athletes wouldn't care if they explode as long as they win. Um, uh, be going out in glory. Um, but they're very, they're very committed to, to winning. And so it's not surprising that they would do that. That is, well, it, it, it could be, but it, it is probably fortuitous in the sense that, um, in fact, ICAR was developed to uh, 
to impact purine metabolism. And it was actually designed to work on adenosine receptors. It was actually made before AMP kinase was discovered by Graham Hardy uh, in 1996. Uh, AMP kinase, although it's been around a long time, obviously it's conserved in all species, including yeast, but it wasn't actually identified enzymatically until uh, the mid 90s. And um, so the drug was developed for a different purpose. Um, and this turns out to be its principal action. Now, it's not clear uh, whether it, there are other parts of the way in which this drug works that would be beneficial uh, through purine metabolism. We don't know. It's a, it's a very good question, uh, but you can't tell that with this particular drug. So you would predict that, that anything that increased AMP in the cell by, would mimic the effects of exercise, in fact, a car is a non-metabolism AMP uh, med. So if that were true, then would you predict that, that uncoupling agents like 2,4-dinitropenol or FCCP by increasing the AMP concentration in the cell by uncoupling mitochondria might do the same thing as they are? Well, that's actually been tried. Uh, and yes, I think that we haven't tried that experiment ourselves. If you could do that in a safe way, uh, that's another way to, to achieve uh, a switch in, in the AMP a ATP ratio. And to the extent that you could do that in a safe way, I would say yes. Uh, I think that's very, very possible. Uh, I think the secret is getting selectivity so that you don't impact much on the heart um, and, uh, and, uh, and weakness in a drug. Because if you're going to work with the mitochondrial toxins, you don't want them to be overtly uh, uh, damaging. What I like about AMPK agonists is that they promote a natural process um, and something that, that would naturally occur if you were going to exercise, uh, which is activation of AMP kinase. <clears throat> um, so there is, uh, in my view, a benefit in terms of, of metabolic health and also physical health in promoting a pathway that naturally gets promoted anyway, um, as opposed to blocking a process, uh, because blocking a process often comes with other side effects. I mean, it's, it's just like trying to, to lose weight by blocking, by reducing appetite. I think it's possible to do that, but uh, drugs that reduce appetite often have other kinds of problems. And so I like uh, the, the potential of an AMPK mimetic because it has certain uh, conceptual benefits. But I think your idea is perfectly fine, and, and uh, I predict in the right way it could work. The AMPK, ICAR is, lo muscle loves to take it up, and so it really has a great effect uh, in skeletal muscle. I don't know about drugs that would, you know, inhibit uncoupling. Yeah. Well, like the, um, <coughs> the other part of your talk about this disrupting the circadian has all these negative effects uh, and making your obesity and everything. So the other thing is that caloric restriction, so this is the, the red wine pill, right? Yeah. So you can imagine that caloric restriction is known to activate AMPK and the lower organisms has been nicely worked out. And that would presumably have some of these beneficial effects and caloric restriction in fact does, but it would also disrupt the circadian clock based on this model, right? Because you have this, perhaps this elevated level of AMPK continuously. <coughs> I mean, these are the people who are really trying caloric restriction diet to, its, you know, the real caloric restriction diets. Well, is that the question? Well, the question is, does it disrupt circadian rhythm? No, so, uh, so caloric restriction, it's, it's a very interesting, it's a very, it's a very good point, it's a very important point. I, I do think that, that AMPK activation does somewhat mimic caloric restriction because it, it by itself would get activated during caloric restriction in an attempt to replenish energy supplies to cells which are being depleted of that energy. Um, in terms of the circadian clock, in a continuous background of, of, of reducing body nutrient sources, um, the daylight cycle seems to be operating perfectly fine. And the way we do it, we're giving a pulse uh, of, um, ICAR at a high transient dose, then you can alter the rhythm, uh, in this case, in the liver. Um, and so, but 
the tonic lowering of calories, actually the body is very good at managing, oddly enough, particularly in humans, uh, starvation. We're very good at that, and, uh, and we tend, uh, animals that are being starved tend to have a perfectly good um, a circadian clock, actually. Um, on the other hand, animals that are overfed tend to be pretty lazy while they're digesting. But when you start to become hungry again, uh, that's when you become aroused, uh, and you, you begin to, be, begin to be develop the predatory behavior. Uh, to look for food. Yeah, Ron, uh, is there any point of convergence of PPS delta and ERR in terms of regulation of those genes? Because essentially, if you are activating two different pathways, contributing to the eventual global level go through the muscle. Yeah, so, uh, the, so the, the, there, there, it, the confluence of PPR delta and ERR, which are both, in a sense, lucky for us, uh, that we happen to be studying these things without knowing where that they would converge, but they do converge. Um, and that uh, the, they can activate many of the same pathways. Now I have to say that there's a difference. PGC1-alpha is pretty much universal. Um, PPR delta is universal. Probably HIF1-alpha is pretty much universal. ER gamma, highly restricted. And so gamma is, is restricted to type 1 muscle fiber. In terms of muscle, it's restricted to type 1 or endurance fiber. It's expressed in a small number of other cells in the body. For example, a small cluster of cells in the motor neurons of the spinal cord, which we don't know. It's a new population, undescribed population. I don't know what it means yet. But I'm sure it's going to link into uh, some features of metabolic regulation or maybe motivated behavior. We don't know exactly uh, at this stage, but uh, there's a few other sites uh, in the nervous system where it's expressed. And so I think it's serving a different function because delta is activated naturally by fatty acids that are being brought in during exercise uh, in the body. Um, and PGC1 is being naturally activated by exercise as well, and it's being induced. Gamma is uh, pretty much transparent to fatty acids or energy stores. It's driving this program. I think it's bypassing the need for those pathways. Uh, so you get many of the same targets, uh, but uh, in, a, in advance of the demand. It's just a way that, that you have to set a baseline that anticipates need to get you going. At least that's how we look at it. It's a little bit of an interpretation, but. Yeah, so the question was, have we looked at comparative genetics between other primates and humans uh, in terms of uh, the evolution of, of uh, endurance and um, uh, something like ERR uh, gamma? The answer is no, we haven't looked at that yet, although there, there's anthropologic studies that have linked the evolution of endurance, upright behavior, running behavior, long distance running behavior in particular to our predatory behavior. Um, it's not known how that occurred uh, and it, precisely why it occurred, but it does appear to be something that at least anthropologically changed our behavior because it gave us new capabilities. And so the coevolution of endurance uh, and predatory behavior really underlies, I think, a lot of features uh, that, that relate to our humanness and distinguishes us from other primates. So I think the comparative genomics is, is important, but it's going to take us beyond just muscle. Uh, it takes us into a very integrative process, and we haven't uh, approached the, the primate genome yet. So it's a really interesting question, though. Okay. Thank you very much. Once again.